Hello, you're watching Innovation Africa with GE, where we explore innovative ways to address Africa's big social economic issues. I'm Wale Famrewa, and thank you for tuning in. Beyond facilitating social interaction, transportation infrastructure is vital to trade and commerce across the continent. Like power, transportation infrastructure is a major weakness limiting Africa's economic growth potential. Potholed roads and missing rail links often get in the way of economic growth. Landlocked countries are often worst hit, and according to research by the London Economic Magazine, transport costs often make up 50 to 75 percent of the retail price of goods in countries such as Malawi, Rwanda, and Uganda. Today's program brings together a great panel of investors and advisors in Africa's transport infrastructure sector. In Johannesburg is Tim Schweiker, CEO of GE Transportation in China and Sub-Saharan Africa. He's also the CEO of GE South Africa. And joining us in Nairobi is Vishal Agarwal, Africa Infrastructure Specialist and former partner at PricewaterhouseCoopers Kenya. And sitting here in Lagos is Wale Shunibare, Managing Director, Investment Banking at UBA Capital. Together, our panel will examine the smart thinking required to upgrade Africa's transport infrastructure, innovation in the formulation of policies for transport infrastructure in Africa, and incentives for investors across the continent. Gentlemen, Wally, thank you very much for joining us for this conversation. Wally, I'm going to start with you. And I think it's always good to start with policy making. So we're trying to fix transportation infrastructure across Africa. Your thoughts, first of all, about how we, we rejig the policy in that respect. I know in Nigeria, for instance, there's a, a, a big discussion around an infrastructure master plan. Perhaps that's where we should start in fixing Africa's transport infrastructure. Your thoughts? We have to have an infrastructure master plan because policy has to be driven by government. Uh, government has to highlight what the priority areas are and di uh, di direct investors to those priority areas. Mm -hmm. So we start with the infrastructure master plan, we then make it uh, conducive for private sector investment. So there are quite a number of uh, policy ideas that government can bring forward to and make that happen. In terms of getting the key elements of that infrastructure master plan, in your thoughts, what are the things that African, African policymakers need to address in planning for transport infrastructure across the continent? It's, it's absolutely crucial that we have an integrated transportation policy. So you have to link transportation by air, by road, by rail, um, and also novel things like cable cars that are being considered in some countries. Mm. After that, you have to look at ways of making sure government provides sufficient incentives to direct private sector investment right, into we'll those We'll get sectors. into a lot of those incentives later on. But I want to bring in Vishal from Kenya into the conversation. Vishal, your thoughts about planning for infrastructure across the continent. What for you should be the key elements to look out for here? Well, the big challenges have been uh, lack of technical capacity, lack of building, uh, manufacturing facilities and ancillary businesses to support uh, Africa infrastructure development in the region. So th th that along with the fact that there are developers that are far and few in between, not enough for developers in the region, not enough of seed capital available for these projects, not enough of thinking around the feasibility and navigation of these projects has been the challenge. So that must be the focus going forwards. In East Africa, we're seeing a very uh, ambitious project to link a railway line across several countries. And that, I guess, speaks to the importance of an integrated plan for the region. And your thoughts about this? Uh, do you think this is an element that is missing in Africa where we, have, where, where we need to focus on planning on a regional level? Yes, I, I think there are some real critical corridors and regional plays that must be, um, it must, must be actualized. But really what is happening in Kenya is an example around the standard gauge rail. And for the first time in 100 years, 100 plus years, we actually have a new railway that's going to be built, $4 billion uh, going into this thing. And, and the rail line probably going to be complete in the next 42 months. So that's a huge win, as, as you probably know and have reported before. You know, the Chinese premier has been here. 90% of this financing is coming from China. 
10% from the sovereign of Kenya. So it's a very exciting time in the region. All right. Let me bring Tim in because, Tim, uh, you, of course, are the CEO for G Transportation in China and Sub-Saharan Africa. So you probably know a little bit about how to plan for transportation in, in a large continent. Uh, many people will call China a continent, given its size. So your take about the, the importance of planning and what are the key elements that are important for you? Sure, uh, thanks. Um, you know, I, first off, a, a tremendous opportunity here on the continent in terms of uh, rail infrastructure and as uh, some of the other uh, panelists have mentioned earlier, they're really, really vital to um, the economic development uh, of Africa and, and essential to Africa reaching its, its economic entitlement. Um, you know, the way, we, the way that we work, we tend to work uh, country by country. Um, and uh, going back to the first question around policy, I think it's very important uh, that the country recognizes the importance of having a policy uh, around transportation, specifically around rail. And a good example of that, I think, is here in South Africa, where, um, the, uh, where Transnet has laid out a seven-year plan to re and, and, and spending about 330 billion rand to revitalize uh, its, its rail infrastructure. So often, you know, the, we, we do work with governments and, and, and try, to, uh, uh, try to work with them and give them some ideas on how they can better refine their policy and objectives. Uh, but then we very much then become a partner with them uh, in, terms, in terms of the execution uh, when it comes down to a specific uh, project level. Let's talk a bit about G's engagement with the government. I know you have country to country, country to company um, agreements that clearly are, are vital in terms of bringing that public and private partnership to bear in fixing Africa's infrastructure and, of course, specifically here, transport infrastructure issues. Let's speak to that, the importance of the government working closely with the private sector in getting these things done. Sure. So many of the countries uh, on the continent here, uh, again, it starts with the government. And um, so what we've done is we've signed MOUs in uh, places such as uh, Nigeria, Ghana, uh, Kenya, and Angola uh, to kind of set the right, uh, to make sure that we're aligned with the objectives uh, that the country has and that we have a, a document of understanding of how we're going to work together towards uh, those objectives. So we've done that um, across uh, many of uh, the sectors within our portfolio. Uh, power as an example, uh, another uh, rail uh, transportation, uh, oil and gas in Angola, uh, and uh, also in healthcare. And while I want to bring you back into the conversation here, and uh, again to the issue of working with the private sector, um, clearly the government is not going to do it alone. We know that they're they going to make the enabling environment uh, available for investors. So in terms of partnering with the private sector, what for you are the key elements that the government needs to make that happen? Mm. Well, what, what I say to my clients, both public and private, is that there are six main things that you need to do. First of all, you have to have realistic projects that are properly scoped. Mm. The, secondly, your projects have to be well prepared. You know, so there's a lot of feasibility studies, environmental impact studies that need to be done. You have to have deep uh, capital markets, particularly if you want to attract local currency, because you need to channel savings into investment. So capital markets, very critical. And then you have to have uh, a regulatory environment that will make investors feel comfortable, yeah. which is absolutely key. Right. There should be sanctity of contract. Once you sign up to something, you have to agree to it. And lastly, um, you need to have an experienced bidder community. If you can't get them locally, you need to attract them from overseas. Your bidders have to be sufficiently experienced to be able to uh, you know, deliver the project. All right. Vishal, I want to get your thoughts on some of the points that uh, Wally just raised here. And one that struck me is the issue of sanctity of contracts, making sure that um, investors feel comfortable doing business in Africa. And as you've, I mean, with, in your experience, have you seen that change over the last few years? Do you get the sense that um, authorities in Africa are ready to get um, private capital into the continent to fix transport infrastructure? I think there is some progression, but for me, this is not merely about bringing capital to infrastructure as as you know your panelists on this panel will tell you that there are probably 21 more steps to getting this right navigating through regulatory issues 
through both the equity debt pieces, but to understand what's happening with the customer, if there's a fuel supply angle, understanding that, you know, making sure that the product guy, the, you know, the, the supplier of technology and product, whether the locomotives or signaling or aircraft engines, is brought into the equation at the right time. Navigating through all of that is really key to getting it done. And, you know, the contract, between the public and private sector that holds the tenancy or the concession or the, the supply of a goods or service together is just one part of it. And yes, it's getting better. There's lots of uh, capacity building that's come from other markets and in increasingly so. So for example, in Kenya, the government today is preoccupied with finding an innovative solution around uh, the national roads program. So the government of Kenya, for example, is trying to do 20,000 roads over the next five years, 20,000 kilometers worth of roads over the next five, six years. And it's looking to Southeast Asia, for instance, to see, you know, can an annuity model be a little more helpful than trying to do some sort of straightforward road concession and charge a toll, for instance. So there's more and more progression, there's more and more innovation, but as some of the speakers have already said, a lot more work needs to go in. Tim, I want to get your thoughts, um, especially when you look at a country like China. Um, what, are, what are the elements that you see that you think Africa can, needs to, to learn from? Because we know huge investments in infrastructure across China, and they're getting it done. So what can we learn from China? Well, I think the first thing, uh, the first thing you can learn from China is that uh, you know, China has been uh, very clear in its intent to invest in infrastructure and understands that without that investment, uh, they will be, their, their, their economic, long-term economic growth will be uh, jeopardized. So I think that's, that's the number one point. I think the second thing would be that uh, you really need an integrated approach. And where China is much simpler than the challenges we have here in Africa in the sense that it's one government, uh, there is one entity that is, that is uh, calling the shots in terms of uh, their, and, and I'm talking in the context of rail transportation, Whereas here on the continent, you're dealing with you know, multiple governments and being able to overcome the regional integration challenge, I think is something that's unique to the continent that China has not had to deal with. Vishal, I want to get your thoughts about a point I think Tim alluded to just now, and that's the, the need to integrate these policies. I mean, he just talked about railways. We see quite a few landlocked countries in Africa, and they clearly need access to the coasts. So your thoughts about the, the, the need and the urgency for a government in Africa to integrate their programs for transport infrastructure? Well, I mean, I think there's a lot of work that's being done by these regional trade blocks and, for example, in the East African case by the East Africa Union and the East African states in terms of, you know, regulatory hurdles, some of the taxation issues, all of that stuff that kind of tends to be the obstacle or the roadblock from a policy and regulatory standpoint to getting any of this done. The next bit of this is to actually get the, the infrastructure around the port and the bloodline into through the region sorted out. And Kenya, for instance, f speaking for East Africa, is playing a key role. So whether it's the Lamu port, the upgrade of Mombasa, the Lamu corridor overall, and now with the standard gauge, those are the pieces that need to be built in first. So you can talk about linking Uganda with something or Rwanda with something, but that something must be contemporary and modern that gets us to the port in time and in a seamless manner. So Kenya is playing more of a leading role, right. and if you actually look again and see what happened with the standard gauge, this is why a bunch of East African presidents showed up at the ceremony of the standard gauge rail. Clearly, um, Wally, one of the things that we can see in East Africa is there's a lot more integration than we're seeing in West Africa, for instance. He just made a point about Kenya taking the lead in main, getting many of these projects off the ground. When you look at West Africa, clearly everyone has to look to Nigeria. So your thoughts about the opportunity for Nigeria to take the lead here, to make sure that when it comes to things like roads, railways, across this region, and of course, even water transportation, someone needs to take the lead. And your, for you, your, your thoughts about the opportunity for Nigeria to do that? Yeah, Nigeria certainly needs to take the lead. And we can, uh, we have to work very closely with the ECOWAS block to do it. We can borrow a lead from what's happened in Europe with trans-European networks and a, a, a fund that's been provided to um, help develop priority projects. The other thing that the African Development Bank is doing is the Africa 50 Fund, which will help develop 
uh, projects as well because mm. project development is part of the key to unleashing the private sector participation. So Nigeria can be at the forefront of leading that initiative to fund cross-regional, cross-border projects, and they need to be integrated. All right, thanks, Wale. Um, Tim, your thoughts on this point, especially when you look at West Africa, Nigeria, the opportunity for Nigeria to really take the lead, and maybe some of the selling points you think that Nigeria can put on the table to make sure that others get involved, other countries um, buy into an idea of an integrated uh, transport infrastructure in this region. Sure. Uh, you know, I, I think that Nigeria, first off, I, I think it is essential that uh, they take the lead because uh, with, you know, a population of 180 million people, a rapidly growing economy, uh, rail infrastructure is going to be uh, absolutely critical uh, to it, for that continued growth. And so I think it's very important that, that Nigeria takes the lead. I think some of the things that they, that they need to uh, continue to focus on, I know they're investing in building out the rail infrastructure track. Uh, the other thing that I think uh, that there is a need for in Nigeria is uh, to improve on the operation side and uh, on the service and skills development side. Uh, we have an MOU with Nigeria uh, to help uh, towards uh, all of those objectives, including also, uh, also localizing uh, the, uh, the building of equipment, uh, specifically locomotives in Nigeria. And I think by building that critical mass in Nigeria then, uh, that, that could, there can be a natural extension then into the, the adjacent uh, countries and they can actually supply a lot of that service and capability. All right, Tim, thanks for that point. Vishal, before I uh, go to an ad break, your thoughts about this whole issue about the opportunity in Nigeria. I mean, when we look at across Africa, like I mentioned earlier, especially East West Africa, they, it seems to be lagging behind in terms of that integration um, as an economic block. So your thoughts about what Nigeria can do and of course, maybe one thing we need to sell to the authorities here is the opportunity that this presents if we do get that transport infrastructure linked up in this region. Well, I think Nigeria actually has made great strides already and is, is, is definitely showing the way, whether you talk about you know, the airport PPP project or more and more of the road deals that are happening, you know, the cable car project that, I, that I've been following for some time that was talked about earlier. You know, there is, there is more and more development using some sort of a PPP model and, and fairly successfully. So I, th I think, you know, more has to be done in, in, in that area, but Nigeria can show for some really good stories and tell the tale that actually we can do it with regional development part partners. We can do it with, you know, good technology companies that provide, you know, great technology solutions and the, the, the point that one of your panelists made earlier around bidders and the lack of bidders, Nigeria is actually one that's demonstrated, whether it's in power or transport or airports, that you know, local, local companies coming together in partnership with some of the larger development companies around the world can really carry the, carry the day in terms of making some of these projects real. So I think exporting some of that knowledge playing a role with Ghana and Senegal and in the region more actively is something that I think Nigeria can do you know, very well with some of, some of the uh, successes that, that Nigeria can show for today. We head into a short break now and when we come back, we continue our discussion about innovation in fixing Africa's transport infrastructure. Welcome back to Innovation Africa. The panel today includes Tim Schweiker, CEO of GE Transportation in China and Sub-Saharan Africa, who joins us from South Africa, and in Nairobi, Vishal Agawal, as Africa as infrastructure specialist and former partner of PricewaterhouseCoopers in Kenya. And over here in Lagos is Wale Shonibare, Managing Director, Investment Banking at UBA Capital. Wale, let me continue with you. And now I want us to focus more on you know, government shaking hands with the private sector. Um, we're going to talk about elements like PPPs, etc. So first of all, I want to get your thoughts about funding this change. It's definitely going to cost quite a bit. And we see in Africa right now, one, one progression, especially in countries like Senegal, Nigeria, Angola, of course, sovereign wealth funds, you know, governments trying to manage itself like the private sector in terms of its savings. Your, your thoughts about how governments can engage the private sector in funding the infrastructure upgrade that we need in Africa? 
Okay, um, there are a number of key areas where government can intervene. First of all, you have to mobilize local savings, and that's what the sovereign wealth, wealth funds are doing. So both on a personal level and on an institutional level. So at the institutional level, you have your sovereign wealth funds, you have your collective investment schemes that have savings to invest in infrastructure companies and also securities issued by those companies. At a you know, personal level, there are also tax incentives that can be given to allow investors to buy those securities. Once you've done that, now you have the pool of savings that you can use to provide credit enhancement. So typically on road projects, particularly greenfield road projects, you don't know what the traffic volumes are going to be. So initially you provide some credit enhancement, uh, such as minimum revenue guarantees that allow those projects to be economically viable. Those credit enhancements guarantees can decline over time as traffic volumes grow on the roads. So we've right. seen on the Lake Equair Expressway in Lagos how the traffic level volumes have grown. And then there are other incentives such as, you know, um, there will be an increase in property values. So in many countries, uh, developers are being asked to pay towards the development of uh, transportation infrastructure from the increase that they benefit from the uh, values that are, uh, that are going to rise, surely. Then you have other areas such as subsidizing the initial construction costs because affordability is actually a key uh, issue in developing these projects using private finance. And there's always an issue about abil uh, ability to pay versus willingness to pay. So if you don't manage public perception very well, it could cause issues for, for investors. All right, a very interesting point you're making there. Vishal, your thoughts on this point. Um, innovation in funding, um, the upgrade of transport infrastructure in Africa, linking with the, gov the governments, with the private sector. Your thoughts on how we can get this going? Well, well there were a couple of pieces to this. First, it's really important to distinguish between um, what I call non-economic infrastructure and economic infrastructure. So for instance, building a standard gauge line in some sort of a PPP model when the bill is $4 billion in, in the region may not be or is not viable from a PPP perspective. However, putting locomotives or signaling or having some sort of operating agreement related to that kind of infrastructure or airport or pipeline may be very vi viable. So breaking that up between what is economic and what is non-economic is kind of the first step. The other part to it is then, are investors interested in supporting these sovereigns as they invest in the infrastructure? And I, I think this is a really important week for the government of Kenya, where it has a great, great success, a great story on the backs of the Eurobond, where the government went out looking for a billion and a half US dollars uh, from a Eurobond and has got bids of eight. So it's going to take $2 billion, out of which going to put a billion and a half to work around infrastructure, specifically for infrastructure and use maybe five, six hundred million for national budgetary reasons. But in, in a week where we actually had, sadly enough, a terrorist attack on our, on our coast, 50 people plus dead, the same week we actually have five times oversubscription of our euro bond and pricing less than what we went out to the market looking for. So there's great confidence, and there are other countries in the region who have also gone out to capital markets looking for money. And I think that's really the story. So a, a lot of hoorah around what these governments can do using their own abilities to raise capital, and then the private sector come in, coming in in areas which are actually viable. Tim, your thoughts on this point about how we get this funded, um, especially if you can allude to your experience looking at places like China, how do we get the funding, for, especially from the government side, to get some of these trans transportation infrastructure projects off the ground? Sure. Well, I think the challenge here in, on the continent is very different than China. You know, China just uh, announced that they're going to take their uh, annual rail spend up from 100 to 128 billion. So that's, that's a decision that's made at the uh, you know, highest level of the government that's partly, uh, partly done to help stimulate the economy but also to continue with their strategy of building out their infrastructure. I think here it's more challenging. Uh, again, it's very much country to country, but I, I always say the funding is very attainable uh, if there is a bankable project. And the bankability of a project uh, always starts with the revenue source. So 
Uh, what we try to do is work with governments and make sure that we start with that, that part of the financial equation to make sure that there is a solid plan around off takers. Uh, and what we often find is that there, there, there's, there's kind of a catch-22 where the, there are off takers out there that are very capable of paying and, and would benefit greatly uh, from the investment, but they're skeptical in terms of will the service be reliable. Uh, and so we try to get into that, um, uh, get into that dialogue uh, and, help, uh, and, and help convince the off takers that, uh, that this is the right thing for them long term and to try to get them to buy into it. But we find that if you can, if you can uh, get high confidence in the, uh, in the revenue stream, uh, finding, finding the, uh, the, the partners to come in and fund and build the project is relatively easy. Let's dwell on that theme about bankable projects. Um, from your experience, Tim, uh, because when you look at a place like Nigeria, for instance, when I uh, interact with advisors, investors, one of the point that they tend to make is that there are not enough bankable infrastructure projects in this country. So what can the government do to make some projects that today don't look so bankable what can they do to make them bankable? Well, it's, a diff it's, a, it's not an easy question to answer because I think, um, it, again, it's very specific to the project. I think a lot of it is, I think what the government could do, and particularly in Nigeria, is I think um, picking the best bets, and, and they've done this as an example, I think, uh, on, uh, in the energy sector, uh, picking, the, picking the best bets in the transportation sector and really championing those along with strong uh, private partners. Uh, and again, pulling in uh, the other stakeholders, as an example, the off-takers. Vishal, do you want to dwell on this point as well, making projects bankable in Africa? I mean, he just talked about the energy sector in Nigeria. One of the things that he tried to do to make that bankable was to create a bulk trader that would buy uh, any energy that is um, created by the generation companies here. So in, in looking at transport infrastructure specifically, you know, what ideas can we give to policymakers to make many of those projects bankable? Well, as I said earlier, separating out the hard infrastructure from the technology and innovation is probably one, because that's where maybe there's some better scale, that's where you could get consumers to maybe pay for some of it. Um, I, I think that, that really is key, to take sort of the, the harder bits of the infrastructure out that are hard to fund um, away from the technology solutions, away from um, the mobile infrastructure, particularly as it relates to transport, might, might really be something to focus on because there's some very interesting asset-based financing that can be done around uh, leasing equipment, around doing some sort of annuity-based model. There's a lot that can be done there. It's the, as I keep saying, the non-economic infrastructure that, that continues to hold back what is bankable and what's not. Uh, Wale, do you want to share some thoughts on this point about making projects bankable? Earlier you mentioned the issue of credit enhancements. I, I imagine that that is part of it. Yes, yes, there are quite a number of things. If we look at what's going on in Lagos with the uh, metro uh, that the government is building, they've decided to separate out the financing of the track from the actual rail services. So the, the track is being funded by government and the rail services will be uh, run by private sector. Because the thing is you can't expect to recover the entire cost of the heavy infrastructure from tariffs alone. So you can actually de-risk a project by picking out the best areas for the private sector to fund and the best for the government to fund. In the area of credit enhancement, we believe that capital markets have a significant role to play. One of the ways in which you get private sector investment into infrastructure is government can build the infrastructure very quickly and then privatize it. Mm -hmm. So we're going to see a number of uh, airport concessioning in Nigeria and also the rail concessioning. So government is fixing the rail lines first and then they will privatize it. Once you privatize it, you can get institutional investors to invest in the securities of these companies that may now be listed on the uh, local exchanges or may be able to issue bonds that can be credit enhanced. So the credit enhancement, the same way that monoline insurance companies operate and will confer uh, a, an investment grade rating 
on an instrument that otherwise would not have been investment grade. That's how you get the significant pull of pension funds investment into long-term infrastructure development. And these are the best investors for long-term infrastructure because they have a long investment horizon. But what about the place of sovereign guarantees, multilateral guarantees? Um, what role can they play in this? Because we know, for instance, in the power reforms in yeah. Nigeria, we saw the World Bank play a role there. Yes. So your thoughts about how we can bring those things to, to just um, give the private sector a lot more comfort in putting their money into projects? Sovereign guarantees are useful, but they have to be deployed very carefully because you recognize them on the country's balance sheet as contingent liabilities and they can add to national debt. But in terms of getting the uh, sector going, we've seen examples from places such as Chile where they gave some guarantees to allow transportation projects to take off and also exchange rate guarantees critically because many of the long-term investments still come from overseas denominated in US dollars or some other foreign currency and your revenues are in local currency. So you have to be able to, you can't always pass that exchange rate risk to the local consumer. So you have to be able to protect them with some kind of exchange rate guarantees which may fall away later on. Vishal, any more thoughts on this point about how we enhance projects, how we make them look better for investors? Maybe taking away some of the points that um, Wally has just made. Well, Wally made some really good points. In terms of credit enhancement and some of the risk mitigation and the instruments available, I think trying to push some of these multilaterals uh, into uh, more innovation and trying to get them into uh, get them to uh, really de-risking what you need as opposed to covering uh, exchange controls or expropriation or any of that is, is really key. So a good example is several years ago, I was involved in the concessioning of what became Rift Valley Railways, the Kenya-Uganda railway concession in the region. And one of the key things that we were afraid of is working with these two governments, what if there's some sort of termination? in the concession. What happens then, having, ha having spent all this money from a private sector standpoint? So getting a partial risk guarantee from the World Bank is what we ended up doing. And by doing that, we've created a halo effect for that concession where some of the softer things like expropriation or currency risk or some of the other government type of interference that the private sector or the funding, the funding banks would be worried about have now been addressed. So that's one example of, of how it can be accomplished. Tim, do you want to add some thoughts on this point about how uh, we can enhance projects in Africa? Yeah, just to follow up on Vishal's uh, uh, comments, I think, um, I, I think the government's uh, willingness to give concessions, uh, I think, is very critical because uh, we, we often find that, uh, going back to the thought of the bankability of, of projects, that. Uh, Having um, often the, the, I go back to the idea of service reliability as well, being able to dedicate a particular line as an example to a, a particular concession where there's dedicated off takers, that's also often a very, very important part of the equation, particularly building the confidence around, uh, ar around the reliability of service by bringing in a professional operator. So I, I think that's a, a very critical point. If you can, Tim, just comment very quickly on you know, the other ways that the private sector can engage the government and to, to enhance projects, to, to improve capacity on the continent. I know you're working very closely with many governments at GE, so your take on the other things that the private sector can do to make sure that um, we can get a lot more bankable projects um, on track in Africa. Sure. Well, uh, one of the key things that we often uh, have to deal with, uh, which is you know, requirement for localization. Um, so I think, um, uh, and this also helps with the whole bankability uh, issue too, because the government uh, governments are often you know much more enthusiastic uh, if we can come into uh, a country in a sustainable way. And so I think here in South Africa is a good example of how we've done that. We've set up a, a joint venture. Uh, with a, a, local, uh, uh, a local partner, the mine worker investment uh, company uh, here in South Africa. And then we've also partnered with uh, Transit Engineering as a build partner. So localizing the product here uh, and the supply chain and then bringing skills development uh, and training along with those, I think broadens the value of the package and, and helps uh, garner uh, uh, support from uh, from the government. So 
Uh, we're trying to replicate this model now in, in sub several other countries uh, here on the continent, but I think the one in South Africa is the one that's probably the best example. Wally, if I could, ju if I could just jump in and add to what, what, what Tim was saying, because I think he makes a really critical point, and it ties really well into the points we were discussing again uh, earlier about risk mitigation, right? A really good way to mitigate some of this risk is by creating a local economy that's tied to these projects. That, that, uh, that live their lives off these projects. So, the, you know, the points that Tim were making around, uh, you're creating local manufacturing, a small, medium-sized enterprise that can add to some of the products that companies like GE are supplying into the marketplace, whether they're, whether they're building tools or little parts to the equipment, will then create the kind of stickiness which will dissuade any government, any policy in the future from uh, canceling a project, uh, expropriating a project, or nationalizing a project, because it would be the livelihoods of these people in each of these economies that would be at risk. So I, I think that might be a really good solution in terms of innovation that could be brought to infrastructure in the region. Very interesting point you're making there, Vishal. Thank you. Let's pause for another commercial break, more Innovation Africa coming up after this. Welcome back to Innovation Africa and to our conversation around upgrading Africa's transport infrastructure. Very interesting points made just before the break there. And Wally, I want to get your thoughts about a point I think Vishal alluded to, how we can be innovative about making sure that some of these projects take off and remain, and of course, the incentives for the governments to make sure that they keep to their words in terms of agreement. And I want to talk about the opportunity to make this transport infrastructure upgrade across the continent and industry, because there are so many linked companies that can come as a result of the upgrade that we're seeing in transport infrastructure that will better the lives of the broader African continent. Okay, thanks, Wally. There are two main points I want to make. One is sustaining transportation infrastructure once you've built it. So we've seen in countries where they've established road funds for road maintenance, so you contribute some of the user charges from uh, tolls being paid into a road fund or even uh, taxes on fuel uh, into a road fund that's used to maintain the, the, uh, the projects. And then that allows you to have some sustainability. Then you have to look at the transportation value chain as well, at all the interlinked aspects of transportation. So if you are providing you know, smart cards for uh, uh, ticketing uh, machines, if you can get those made locally, you're also benefiting the local economies. In Nigeria, we've seen a move towards established inland container terminals. So now you, do, you, you get the goods to the port, and then you create a rail line that will take those goods, those containers, into some um, inland depots where you'll then have last mile distribution to various clients. And one thing we've also seen with uh, transportation projects like large metro projects is they can actually be real estate projects. You know, Hong Kong Metro makes more money from real estate than actually from the ticketing. So if you create real estate projects around station developments, you're also benefiting the local economy where you drive retail and all other uh, ancillary services. Very interesting link between real estate and um, infrastructure upgrade, transport infrastructure in particular here. Vishal, if you can just add a few more points to this point, um, point about innovation, how we can make sure that the authorities across Africa really look closely at how we can upgrade transport infrastructure and innovative incentives for those policymakers to make sure that these projects get off the ground. Well, I, I think that it, both from a um, developing SME uh, industry, uh, building capacity, uh, inviting in developers through uh, joint ventures or uh, providing a catalytical kind of environment where uh, large Nigerian and Ghanaian and South African and Kenyan businesses say, well, actually, infrastructure is, is good business and I will make an investment and I will play a key developer role and I'll go and partner up with the developers of this world to give me the technical capacity. I, I think those are the kind of models that need to be played out. And governments inviting in 
uh, capacity building, uh, you know, opportunities. So ultimately, what will sustain our rails and roads and and power projects is if we invest in engineers and technical capacity and operators in in the in field on the ground and. And uh, governments have a big role, shoulder to shoulder, with the private sector in, in doing some of that. Tim, let me come to you. Um, I really want us to focus on PPPs and the key elements that make these um, projects work. And if you can start, first of all, by giving us your thoughts on where, where you think PPPs are better than a concession type um, plan to get some of these um, infrastructure projects off the ground. Sure. Um, you know, the, I think that. Um, PPPs are essential to helping, um, to, to bringing kind of the best ideas from both the government side and from the private side to really, uh, to, to really expand what I'll, what I'll call the possibilities might be. Um, and and let, me, let me give you uh, two, two examples. One, just following up on the comments from uh, Vishal and Wally. I think when we look at infrastructure uh, on the continent, we tend to look at it in kind of a historical perspective instead of a futuristic perspective. And again, I think the MTR example in Hong Kong is a good example of that. But working with governments, uh, the, uh, the, the, the private side working with governments to say, hey, what is the broader uh, equation here? And particularly, again, around the revenue side, because it's revenue that drives the possibilities of, of what can be. So if you start looking at revenue models that include just more than the tariff, but also things like real estate mentioned by uh, Wally uh, and, and, and development, which again, China does quite a bit of this, where you know, the, uh, the values of properties and the developers are very much tied into the transportation infrastructure plans. So I, I think that's one thought. And then I think the other thing that where we can be doing more uh, with government, uh, private side, is on the sustainability and particularly on the technical side. And Vishal mentioned this uh, also. What GE is doing, we're launching a customer innovation center where we're gonna have a thousand, or excuse me, a hundred engineers um, in the innovation center. And the idea is that we have our, our global technology, but often that technology uh, needs to be customized, reinvented, innovated. Uh, for the particular solution uh, in country. So we've already launched a number of, of projects, uh, both within the transportation, but also energy and healthcare sector uh, at our innovation center. Uh, and I think that's a good example of how we can partner with the government on the development sustainability side. And our innovation center, by the way, you know, it's not, uh, we, we bring in partners. So we bring in universities, we bring in uh, we bring state-owned enterprises that have uh, engineering capability uh, so that it, it really becomes kind of a COE for that innovation on the ground in country. Um, but Tim, if you can stay with the subject of technology, um, I think when, when we look at the need for the upgrade in Africa, it's actually an opportunity to bring in new technology uh, to bear in terms of how we change things. Um, we know GE has a rich history in terms of innovation and technology. So your thoughts about the, the, the technology that is available today that Africa can deploy that gives us an advantage in terms of a leap forward uh, compared to what we're seeing in other parts of the world. Now, give, especially, especially when you think about we're just about to deploy new uh, projects across the continent. Sure. So on the locomotive side, uh, we're bringing uh, our latest technology here, our latest propulsion technology. Uh, without getting too technical, um, you know, we have locomotives here that have been running here for 50 years, but they're, you know, they're they're much less effective from a haulageability standpoint and from an emissions and fuel efficiency standpoint. So we're bringing our latest technology here. Uh, and, and we've packaged that and innovated that in uh, what we call an African uh, locomotive that uh, you meets, meets the specific needs uh, here in Africa and, that, and we've now localized uh, of that product. Now, going beyond uh, the locomotive side, we have some very interesting signaling products that uh, you could draw an analogy between kind of landlines uh, in many countries going, you know, skipping landlines and going directly to cell phones. We have a wireless signaling te technology that we think uh, has a great, uh, uh, a, a great uh, opportunity for application uh, on the continent as well. And, and I could go on in every, every one of our GE businesses, healthcare, 
uh, distributive power on how we're taking our technology and, and rethinking it to make it fit uh, the unique needs of the continent. Thanks for that. Okay, Wally, I want to come back to you. And on the use of concessions, I, I alluded to it earlier, your take about how we can deploy this as an interesting way to bring the private sector into upgrading Af Africa's transport infrastructure. Okay, uh, thank you. It's worth making the point that uh, PPPs is a useful tool and concessions for developing infrastructure, but even in the countries that are most successful, not more than about 20% of their infrastructure is being developed using PPPs. The fastest way for governments to build infrastructure quickly is to build it using public money or funds that they've raised from the capital market, build it and then privatize. Uh, so, you know, th that's very useful. But in Nigeria, for instance, I mean, airports concession is, is long overdue, and I know government is thinking about it. Also on the rail sector, that's also uh, a, an area. Anywhere you have direct user charges, I think after a while you can concession or securitize those revenues. So you can securitize the fare box, ticketing opportunities where you have consistent revenues. And that's where, you know, UBA Capital comes in, where we can help uh, bringing capital markets tools to raise money for infrastructure development. Vishal, I want to hear about your thoughts on this point. Um, he just mentioned that in Nigeria, for instance, the, the airports are way overdue for concessions, uh, for the private sector to take over, projects that the government have, have actually put on the ground. And when you look across Africa, and I would like you to be quite specific here, where are the opportunities, where, where do you think the governments need to take their hands off projects and hand them over to the, to the private sector, either by privatization or concessions that, that will clearly upgrade the performance of those um, infrastructure. First of all, I, I, I agree with Wally that I think the public sector can play a more increasing catalytic role in getting some of these, these assets done, then de-risking them and then transferring them to the private sector or quasi-transferring them from a operations role. But having said that, I think that the one big gap where we all need courage, I believe, is in the unsolicited bid side of the PPP uh, market, that most of our PPP laws across the region allow for unsolicited bids where there is some additionality. So I'm a developer. I understand that there may be a need for a city airport because of traffic congestion or security issues, et cetera. I've got a 1,000 acres. Can I offer to build the airport? I'll run it privately, but will you give me the enabling environment, uh, you know, the, the necessary regulatory approval, the concessions, the licenses to make it happen? It's my idea. I bring it to you. Yes, of course, the, the citizens must benefit from it. We must make sure that the user charges are not out of whack. It must perhaps even be regulated. So you can then deploy someone to test value for money. But will you look at my ideas and consider my proposals, say the private, says the private sector, in true partnership form as opposed to spending the next six years running another public sector tender procurement process to go uncover something, which, which weeds out a lot of the entrepreneurial the opportunities that come about from, from private sector, big and small. So I think th there is a real gap in understanding unsolicited bids and maybe our development partners, maybe through uh, working with former practices like mine, big four firms, can provide some assurance, provide some value for money tests that give our politicians some courage to undertake unsolicited bids. So we need to give our politicians courage. Tim, your thoughts on, on how we can get the governments to, to deploy some assets. I mean, just adding to the points that we've heard from Wally and Vishal, your sure. thoughts on how we can get the governments to invest in uh, infrastructure projects that they will eventually hand over to the private sector. Yeah, the, I'd like to kind of follow up on uh, Vishal's comments because what, what we see is a, um, often a, lot, a lack of consistency in terms of how governments go about uh, procurement. And to Vishal's point on coming in on kind of an entrepreneurial basis where you have an idea and how do you, how do you if you're gonna invest in developing that idea, how do, you, how do you keep that from going to tender? And so we find it often when we're doing, we're, we're taking that, that entrepreneurial approach where we, we think we have an innovative idea we're often up against, well, it's a, you know, our procurement laws require us to go to tender with this. 
And so that, that would uh, discourage uh, companies like GE from doing a lot of upfront uh, development work ahead of time. Um, but then likewise, you see uh, other examples like the project that uh, Vishal mentioned, the Standard Railway project uh, in Kenya, uh, which did not go to tender. Um, you know, that was a, a government to government deal. So I, I think consistency and in, in working with governments and, and how they uh, are, are treating these projects is one of the challenges that we have to deal with. And Wally, I want to get your thoughts about this and if it's possible at all. We know transport infrastructure is very capital intensive, but what will you say are the low hanging fruits for um, investors who are looking this way, um, who want to get involved in transport infrastructure the same way they get into power infrastructure in, in Nigeria, for instance. What are the low hanging fruits that you think that they can begin to consider in this market? Yeah, I think uh, there are several low hanging fruits adding to what uh, Tim and Vishal have already said. Uh, for me, uh, rail is a big area, and once the government have uh, completed the initial overhaul of the rail infrastructure, I think they, we can start to see some attractive concessions coming out. Yeah. Airports is also a significant area that's likely to come through. Even air transportation um, itself, you know, we, the, the, the growth in air transportation has been quite significant, so new airlines are being set up all the time. And last but not least, there's ferry transportation, there's a lot of waterways we have in Lagos in particular, and I know the government is uh, building uh, stations to allow concessions to be run, ferry concessions. All right, Vishal. We need to wrap up now, but final thoughts on this whole point about fixing Africa's transport infrastructure. What would you leave to investors, to policymakers in Africa? Well, I think look for the scale. And as, as uh, both Wally and Tim have said, follow the money, look for the revenue, and look for the scale. So if it means, rather than setting up five airlines, can five governments come together and say, we'll do one airline that we'll share? Can, can we have you know, hubs that service an entire region and therefore open up trade to the entire region as opposed to each government wanting to invest in a 3,500 kilometer r r runway just in case a 380 is going to land in my little country. So I think looking for scale, following the revenue model and then coming together in a proper manner to build something to benefit our economies is, is what I would dare to advise our governments. Tim? Quick comment from you as well. Final sure, I, I like uh, I like Vishal's word courage. Uh, I think all of us, both on the private side and and uh, on the government side, need to have more courage. I, I think when you when you have the conceptual discussion about the needs for uh, transportation infrastructure uh, in, on the continent, everybody shakes their head and agrees. But when it gets down to making the commitments and some of the trade offs. And uh, particularly uh, on a regional basis, uh, I think is, is something that really needs to be stepped up. Um, and um, I think if, if, if investors see that, uh, you're, the, you're, is the getting, the, getting the financing will not be an issue because I just think the economic benefit and impact is going to be so substantial uh, that, um, uh, that finding the investment side of the equation uh, can easily be done. Let's leave it on that note. A call for courage in Africa. That brings us to the end of Innovation Africa with GE. Many thanks to our panelists, Tim Schweiker, CEO of GE Transportation in China and Sub-Saharan Africa, Vishal Agarwal, Africa Infrastructure Specialist and former partner at PricewaterhouseCoopers Kenya, and here in Lagos, Wali Shonibare, Managing Director, Investment Banking at UBA Capital. I also thank our audience in Johannesburg. Until the next edition of Innovation Africa with GE, I'm Wali Famrewa. Thank you for watching.